So was this my dream to become a Nobel laureate when I was a child? Uh, to be honest, uh, when I was a child, I had heard of this prize, and and I think like many people, it, it quickly takes on sort of this mythological proportion. Uh, and uh, like a lot of children growing up in the 60s, I, I had an interest in science and engineering uh, because of the, the space race. Uh, and so I had a lot of toys that fostered an interest in science, one of which I'm going to donate to the museum uh, today. Uh, and I remember hearing a scientist speak for the first time who visited my elementary school when I was in the fifth grade. Uh, and, I, and I think there was a little part of my brain that imagined I might eventually become a scientist. And uh, I think I did have a little part of my brain that dreamt maybe what would it be like to win a Nobel Prize one day. So as a young boy, my favorite subject was mathematics because mathematics to me was a subject where you didn't have to study very much. If you understood the concept, you understood the concept and it stayed with you. I, I didn't particularly like courses where you had to take the books home and memorize lots of facts and inf information. So uh, I loved mathematics initially and then later when uh, computers came along I became interested in computer science because I thought that was a, a way of applying math in everyday life. But I'm embarrassed to say I wasn't Bill Gates and I wasn't Steve Jobs. I didn't see the personal computer revolution that was going to eventually come. I didn't imagine smartphones and so I couldn't imagine a career in computer science and I frankly didn't think I was quite gifted enough in mathematics to be an academic mathematician. So I started to look for other ways I could use a mathematical mindset, if you will, uh, and still make a living. And so I started to gravitate a little bit more towards science and, and medicine. And medicine, uh, it seemed to me, was a way that I could have science and math in my life and use that, use that hopefully for uh, the betterment of, of, of mankind. Uh, my, my father growing up was a lawyer, so maybe I, I was slightly inclined to follow a profession. Now, uh, fr from watching uh, him, I had decided I didn't necessarily want to become a lawyer, but I knew there were some benefits to following a profession, and so I decided to pursue medicine. So I think failure comes in different flavors. So, for example, the first time I attempted to work uh, in a laboratory to do research, I was an undergraduate in college. Uh, and in hindsight, I now appreciate that the project I was given was simply undoable, unimportant, and uninteresting, uh, which is a very bad combination for a young person trying to become a scientist. And then uh, during the last month in the laboratory, I correctly told my professor that by doing a little reading, I had determined that this project would never be completed because it was all based on a mistake of one of my predecessors, a so-called artifact. And so, of course, he rewarded me by giving me a bad grade and telling me I should never work in the laboratory again. So that's one type of failure. And the lesson I took from that is sometimes if you're struggling in a laboratory, uh, the problem might be you, but it might also be uh, the laboratory. Uh, but then there's another type of, of failure where uh, perhaps you're having a challenge mastering a particularly sophisticated technique. And I think any scientist knows that that's part of the, the territory. And sometimes you you muddle through and you master the technique, or perhaps instead you identify a collaborator who's already good at the technique who can help you get over that uh, barrier. Uh, but the final type of frustration, which I think is the most important one for any young scientist to consider, is that as you say, uh, many times our, our guesses and hunches are simply wrong. And sometimes we obtain results that are frankly disappointing uh, given our, our perhaps prior expectations. But, uh, you know, I, I try to remind especially young uh, scientists that if every time you do an experiment you get the expected results, you're, you're probably doing engineering, but you're not really doing science. Uh, and frankly, science would be terribly boring if every time you did an experiment you got exactly the results you thought you were going to get. In fact, I've even gone one step further and said that, a, you know, a good scientist should actually live for unexpected results because, as you probably well know, there are many, many major discoveries that actually began with a completely unexpected result where fortunately there was someone with a receptive mind who decided that they would perhaps pursue this further, even though initially perhaps they couldn't comprehend the significance of what they were seeing. In fact, I've heard one Nobel laureate say that many results 
that might have led to a Nobel Prize probably wind up in the waste paper bin because someone refused to actually look objectively at the data uh, simply because it didn't conform to their prior uh, expectations. I think with any type of frustration that we've talked about, persistence is key. Uh, whether it's having the persistence to overcome uh, various forms of rejection, uh, whether it's a mentor who doesn't have confidence in you, as was the case with my first mentor, uh, whether it's uh, reviewers and editors telling you your papers are not worthy of publication, whether it's uh, a study section rejecting one of your grants, this just goes with the territory and you have to be uh, persistent, uh, perhaps even a little uh, thick-skinned. But likewise, uh, in the laboratory, you have to be persistent because, uh, as you know, in science, seldom are things straightforward and, and linear. Uh, there are going to be obstacles to overcome, and occasionally uh, your data will take you off the path you thought you were traveling on into a different area. Uh, and so I think you just have to be persistent and to live for those occasional moments uh, where you do have those eureka moments where you suddenly have the privilege of seeing something and understanding something that's never been seen or understood before. And so I think knowing that if you're lucky, you will occasionally have those eureka moments that provides you the fuel to get through the frustrating periods. Uh, I would have several uh, pieces of advice. Uh, the first thing I would tell them is everything else being equal. I, I, I'm a big advocate of focusing on studies that teach you how to think rigorously and clearly and logically, because those things never go out of fashion. Uh, you can study and memorize uh, facts and factoids, but sometimes those facts and factoids eventually turn out to be wrong or, or, or irrelevant. Uh, and they're often quite specific to various disciplines. Whereas if you take courses that really train you to think clearly, uh, that will serve you well no matter what you uh, do. So for example, I, I, I actually didn't like biology as a young person because at the time, uh, biology was quite uh, descriptive uh, and uh, wasn't particularly mechanistic. Uh, and I found that terribly boring. Whereas I thought courses like mathematics computer science and physics were very good for helping me to, to think uh, clearly and uh, to arrive at answers that were objectifiably true. Uh, so I tended to steer away, for example, from some of the subjects that I found overly uh, subjective. Uh, the next thing I would tell them is I think one of the keys to happiness in life is to find something you find so rewarding and so fulfilling you would do it even if you didn't need the money, right? So most people go to work every day uh, because they need a roof over their head and they need food on their table and clothes on their back. Uh, and I fully understand that. But what a great privilege it is to do a job that you would do even if you didn't need the money. And so one of the great joys of my life has been, you know, I discovered I, I enjoyed science so much I would do it even if I wasn't getting paid. In fact, there are many times I feel guilty I'm getting paid to do this because it feels like I'm playing rather than working. Uh, and so I think if you can f find such a thing, uh, I think that's that's priceless. And so if you have any interest in science whatsoever, uh, I, I would I would give it a chance and find out whether you really enjoy it because I think it is you know such a great privilege to do something where you come to work every day, you're surrounded by bright people, and you get to follow your curiosity, and if you're lucky, occasionally actually discover something useful. Uh, the night before, someone asked me whether I would be able to sleep knowing that the following morning would be the announcement of the Nobel Prize. And uh, I, I told them that I thought I would sleep quite well because I thought that the chance of winning was no, long, no, no greater than, you know, one or two percent. And maybe even that was optimistic. So I, I, I said at one to two percent, I'll be able to sleep tonight. But at one to two percent, I will leave my phone ringer on, on my bedside table, which I don't normally do. Uh, and I went to bed at the normal hour and I had a very, very vivid dream where I looked at the alarm clock and the time had already passed when I would have gotten the phone call. So in my dream, I was already rationalizing why this might even be a good thing and I was happy before, I'll be happy now, and now I can go back to my work without this distraction. And then I, I, I unfortunately woke up uh, from my dream and saw that the alarm clock said 2 a.m. And I said to myself, I have to do this all over again and go back to sleep. 
And then the phone rang at 4.40 a.m. And at that point, first of all, I was again wondering, is this now a dream or is this now reality? Uh, and it was almost, I described it as almost like an out-of-body experience because I'm listening to this lovely gentleman with a Swedish accent telling me I've won the Nobel Prize. And it was sort of like uh, overwhelming emotions of just uh, gratitude and you know the, the, the overwhelming sense of what a privileged life I've had because uh, so much luck goes into this. And uh, clearly, this is a, a dream for so many scientists. And to think I now have the privilege of, of being a Nobel laureate, it was just quite overwhelming. And, and my next thought was how wonderful it was going to be to share this with all the important people in my life who've made it possible. So I think most people are aware that uh, you need oxygen uh, to live, uh, but less appreciated is the fact that too much oxygen would also be quite toxic and potentially lethal. So uh, all of the animals on the planet, including us, uh, had to uh, evolve a system that would allow the cells and tissues to know whether they were getting enough oxygen and to respond uh, accordingly. So just as you might have a thermostat in your room to adjust the temperature properly, uh, your cells need a system to adjust how much oxygen uh, they're being exposed to. And it turns out precisely because oxygen is important, there are many human diseases where part of the problem is inadequate oxygen delivery to a tissue, such as in a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, th those two diseases are caused because uh, the heart or the brain uh, are not getting enough uh, blood and hence are not getting enough oxygen. So we also know that cancers, in order to grow, uh, have to obtain uh, oxygen. Uh, and we now understand how in some cases they've hijacked uh, the system that we use to uh, sense and adapt to oxygen for their own evil purposes so that they can trick the body into providing, the, uh, providing them with an, an oxygen supply. It started to become uh, clear uh, in the middle to the late part uh, of the last century that cancers arose because of alterations, or scientists call them mutations, in specific genes. Uh, but frankly, until the year 2000, we didn't have the complete list of human genes, and we didn't even know what the normal sequences of those genes were. So uh, it had always occurred to me back in the 1980s when I was still a doctor taking care of cancer patients that treating cancer was a little bit like trying to fix the engine of your car with a hammer. Uh, we, we really needed to understand this disease much better. And so fortunately in the year 2000, we finally obtained the complete list of human genes and their normal sequences. That allowed us for the first time to start to understand which genes are altered or again mutated in specific cancers, and then to start to use that information to develop better, more targeted, more precise drugs. So I think we're in a phase now where things are starting to accelerate because we're starting to uh, reap the harvest of that knowledge that started to emerge in the year uh, 2000. And so more and more now we have uh, new treatments for cancer uh, that are helping many, many patients. But uh, along the way, we've learned that uh, no two types of cancer are genetically identical. And, and even within a given type of cancer, such as breast cancer, uh, the, the, the cancer for one patient might be genetically dissimilar from another breast cancer. And so that's why progress is sometimes frustratingly slow. I, I don't think there's going to be a single magic bullet that will cure all cancers. I think we have to continue to methodically make progress on all of the different cancers uh, because, as I said, sometimes the treatment for one cancer might not be applicable at all to another because of their different genetic makeup. So one source of great sadness and concern for me is this trend in certain quarters to disparage science and to disparage expertise. Uh, I was born in 1957, which was the year of Sputnik. So when I grew up as a young boy in the 60s in the New York area, you know, the, the scientists and engineers, they were the heroes. And I can remember going to ticker tape parades for the returning astronauts, uh, astronauts and like a lot of young uh, children at the time, especially, unfortunately, it was mostly young boys at the time. Uh, I had a chemistry set and a microscope and uh, uh, tr electric cars and a rock collection and a number of things that I think indirectly or directly were fostering an interest in science 
and engineering. And I think uh, for most of my adult life, uh, there was great support for investments in science because I think it was held as indisputable that creating new knowledge was intrinsically good and that this was a gift we gave to ourselves and to future generations. But, but, but now, uh, increasingly, at least again in certain quarters, uh, you hear people disparage uh, science, especially when they don't like the conclusions of the scientists. And so, for example, I think about the, the current debate, and it's sad that I even have to use the word debate because it's no longer debatable, but when you hear a certain climate change deniers uh, make com you know, comments about uh, science uh, as though you get to pick and choose what, what the data tells you, uh, and, and you, you simply uh, can ignore if it's expedient to do so, what the best minds in the world are telling you uh, you should be doing. So I think we, we do this at, at great peril, uh, and I think this is simply a road to the dark ages if the pendulum shifts to the point where uh, you know, expertise is a bad thing uh, and we no longer celebrate science and engineering. Mm -hmm.